To the left on this map, you'll see New Zealand. To the right, you'll see South America. And there, smack in the middle of the South Pacific Ocean, you'll see a letter A. Now, you may be asking yourself why I have dropped a pin in the middle of the ocean, as on first glance, it would appear that there is nothing at this location other than water. If, however, we zoom in, we'll find that what lies directly beneath the letter A is Easter Island, a territory of Chile's with an area of roughly 163 kilometers squared, which, to put in perspective, makes it quite a bit smaller than South Africa, which has an area of roughly 1.2 million kilometers squared. At a distance of more than 2,300 miles from Chile and 4,300 miles from New Zealand, Easter Island is very much on its own in the middle of the South Pacific Ocean. In spite of its proximity to other civilizations and societies, at its peak, it had a population of roughly 18,000 people and flourished in terms of its social and political complexity and systems. However, by the time that a Dutch navigator by the name of Jacob Rogovin made contact with the island on Eastern Sunday, 1722, there were only 2,000 inhabitants left. What happened to Easter Island's civilization? Rano Raraku is a circular volcanic crater on the island about 600 yards in diameter. Surrounding the volcanic crater are 397 stone statues, representing in a stylized way a long-eared, legless human male torso. Mostly, these are 15 to 20 feet tall, but the largest of them is 70 feet tall, and they weigh anywhere from 10 to 270 tons, which is somewhere between 9,000 and 245,000 kilograms. This, however, is just the tip of the iceberg. You see, there are transport roads leading from Rano Roraku, and along these roads, there are 97 more statues. Additionally, on the coast of the island, there are 300 stone platforms, which at one time would have held an additional 393 statues. These giant stone statues are called Moai, and the stone platforms that held them are called Ahu. Ahu is a rectangular platform made not of solid stone but of rubble fill held in place, which weighed anywhere between 300 tons for a smaller one and roughly 9,000 tons for a larger one. They could also have been as wide as 500 feet. Researchers over the past century have learned that the Moai got bigger and bigger over time, likely suggesting rival chiefs commissioning the statues to outdo each other. This theory is further supported by the later presence of the Pukau, a cylinder red headdress that sat on top of the Moai and weighed an additional 12 tons, which you can see here in the photo. Red, because it was the color of the red bird's feathers, which were prized by and reserved for the chiefs. To put this in 2017 terms, this sort of rivalry is not totally unfamiliar to us. Many celebrities nowadays use jewelry, specifically chains, to show off their wealth and success relative to their competitors and rivals. Let's take a look at a few. For example, this is Drake's OVO owl chain, which cost him $120,000. The next, Lil Uzi Vert's Marilyn Manson change, which cost him $220,000. And not to be upstaged or outshined, Quavo's Ratatouille chain cost a whopping $250,000. Now, until recent years, many of these statues were not erect, but torn down. Many of them were, in fact, toppled over. However, in 1994, an, archaeolog an archaeologist named Claudio Cristino began work re-erecting some of these statues. Specifically, he tried to re-erect the statues that had been toppled on the largest platform, one that had held 15 of these statues. Using a crane capable of lifting 55 tons, he sought to re-erect these statues. Even with modern machinery, this task proved challenging as the heaviest one weighed 88 tons. Yet, Easter Island's prehistoric population had owned no cranes, no wheels, no machines, no metal tools, no draft animals such as horses or oxen, and no means other than human muscle 
to transport and raise these sculptures. And yet, not only had these statues been erected, they had been moved around and across the island upwards of nine miles. So how did this happen? Well, for such a thing to happen, a society would need lots of thick, long ropes made from tree bark, by which 50 to 500 people could drag statues weighing 90, or excuse me, 10 to 90 tons, and lots of big, strong trees to obtain all the timber needed for the sleds, canoe ladders, and levers. But to do so, one would need quite a lot of trees, and in 1722, when Jacob Rogovine came to the island, he found that there was no tree on the island over 10 feet tall on what was, without doubt, the most treeless island in all of Polynesia. It's precisely this that has led to many conspiracy theorists using the statues on Eastern Island as proof of extraterrestrial life, as how else could these statues have been erected and moved by a civilization that didn't have trees, let alone modern machinery, which, let me remind you, also couldn't move these statues. This theory, this conspiracy theory, as we can sort of see illustrated in this picture, was further supported by botanical surveys of the island from a half century ago that found that there were only 48 native plant species on the island, which, to again put in perspective, is relative to South Africa's 22,000 native species, with even the largest plant species on the on Easter Island hardly being able to be categorized as a tree at all. In other words, even scientists were stumped for an explanation. Fortunately, botanical surveys have evolved in recent years, and botanists now have the measures to recover evidence of now extinct plant life. In conducting a recent botanical survey of the island, botanists found 21 vanished plant species, many of which would have been valuable to the islanders, such as a form of the Chilean palm tree, which is over 63 feet tall, or others that can grow to well over 100 feet. So this solves part of our mystery, as we now know how these statues were erected and moved. What we still don't know, however, is what happened to those trees and how this once successful and self-sustaining civilization collapsed. First, trees were being burned for firewood. Second, trees were being burned to cremate bodies. Third, trees were being cleared for gardens as almost all of Eastern Island's land surfaces ended up being used to grow crops. Fourth, they were being used to make canoes. Fifth, they were being used for rope and sleds and ladders and other devices and levers to transport statues. Over time, an effect of this varied and constant societal use of trees was deforestation. Consequences of deforestation were threefold and included losses of raw materials, losses of wild-caught foods, and decreased crop yields. Let's dive into each of these separately. In terms of raw material, deforestation would have meant the immediate decrease of all things made from trees and birds, including rope, cloth, and feathers. Lack of large timber and rope brought an end to the erection of statues and also to the construction of seagoing canoes. It also meant people lacked the resources to build thatch homes. It also meant that people were without wool for, few, for fuel to keep themselves dry and warm during Easter's winter nights and driving rain. Instead, Easter's inhabitants were reduced to burning herbs and grasses and other such scraps for fuel. There would have been fierce competition for the remaining shrubbery and small wood pieces. Even burial ceremonies had to change as they could no longer cremate bodies, but instead they took to mummifying their dead. In terms of wild foods, most sources for wild foods were lost. Without seagoing canoes, bones of porpoises, which had been the island's pr principal meat during their first centuries, virtually disappeared. Mainly, islanders were reduced to fish species that could be caught in shallow water or from the shore. Land birds, of course, in turn disappeared completely. Palm nuts, apples, and all other wild fruits dropped out of the diet completely. The only wild food source whose availability remained unchanged was rats. In terms of crop yields, deforestation led to soil erosion by wind and rain, a concept we learned about a little bit earlier this period, before palm trees could protect soil and crops from the hot sun and direct rain. Clearance of the palms led to massive erosion that forced the abandonment of much of the farmland on the 